You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and I know everyone's giving me hell online. This is Jared Mounts with an S. Thank you for everyone that gave me shit about that online. Thank you for the correction. How are you How's doing, it going, Thomas? It's doing pretty good. I think we have a really cool guest actually to have in office in our new setup. So hopefully for you guys watching on YouTube, on a Fishing DMV YouTube channel, um, this is a pretty pretty sick setup that we have going on yeah. here. And today we got uh, Travis Luger with us, and he's he's a Virginia boy through and through, and uh, growing up fishing and uh, on the competitive side, and we're going to get into that. Uh, but he's just been a great asset too for you know us here at Jake's Bait and Tackle, doing seminars. Uh, talking to our youth uh, program and, and just really helping them out. I uh, just really appreciate that about Travis uh, being yeah, a young absolutely. angler himself, being competitive, but also being willing to share, you know, his knowledge. He's mm-hmm. not afraid to to share what he knows, uh, what's brought him success uh, in catching fish. Uh, a couple things about Travis. He's 26 years old. Uh, he's a two-time Bass Nation National Championship qualifier. He's won the 2021 Elite 70 Championship. And he's also the 2021 Boater Angler of the Year champion for the Shenandoah BFL division. Pretty strong stuff right there. Um, so, Travis, thanks for being here today. Uh, let kind of tell our listeners that may not know you uh, who you are and how you got into fishing. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm Travis Luger. Uh, I'm son of Jeff Luger. I've, everybody knows my dad. And um, I got into fishing through my dad and family and just kind of – something i always had a passion for we got pictures of me like maybe 11 months old crawling in dad's boat looking in the live well to see how many fish <laughs> i wish i had the picture for y'all but um we i just always loved it so so always growing up fishing always that's awesome that's awesome i know you know one of the stories I like to tell um we we had a seminar planned for lake anna mm-hmm. and i got a call that morning about 7 30 in the morning that 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 person couldn't come to speak and we've been promoting this and advertising it and you know i think we'd have anywhere between 50 75 people coming and so that kind of put me in a tough spot and i and i could not I thought oh my gosh what are we gonna do we're we gonna cancel this thing or you know who can we bring in that that knows lake anna can talk about lake anna and uh I, I thought of travis and i thought let me it's a long shot but let me see if travis is available and so i think a text messenger called you and i you know i said hey is there any chance and i understand if you can it's late notice it was happening that evening at six uh, is there any chance you can come up and, and share with us about Lake Anna? And he said, what time is it? And I said, 6 o'clock. He said, I'll be there. And I'm telling you, he came up and just nailed it. I mean, mm-hmm. spoke well, uh, gave a tremendous amount of information uh, about the lake, uh, so much so that a lot of guys I noticed were, were a little upset with him for sharing oh, so much. I, I think um, I was there at that one. There, yeah. yeah. Did you have a couple other guest speakers too that uh, lined up that day? Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he just did an incredible job. Yeah, he did. Um, and so um, maybe start off with that. Maybe if you you know you uh, have had some success on Lake Anna. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of our local guys, fished Lake Anna. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about Lake Anna, whether it be winter fishing this time of year, how to catch fish for the weekend angler, not. Doesn't have to be the, the competition angler, but uh, fishing Lake Anna. What what do you what can you tell us? Well, just fishing Lake Anna. Uh, it's it's definitely a tough lake, but that, since there's herring in the lake now, the fish do a lot different things than what they used to do in the past. So, um, like right now, you got water temperatures in the 40s up in the river, and you're still catching them foot deep on spinner baits, crank baits. You know, just mm. finding windblown banks and where the bait is being pushed to you know if you want to catch striper right now you just find the river channel and look because they're everywhere right now and there's a bunch in the lake um crappy right now is fun too you go tim's i'll tell y'all tim's restaurant go to the docks right there and just <laughs> flip a crappy jig you'll catch a hundred wow. um you know it might be little it might be big you never know but uh for bass fishing aspect though winter time a lot of times i like to start down lake look for some fish still schooling which people don't believe they actually still school this time of year but since there's herring in the lake, they still school. They will break the surface. They'll still do that. You might think it's striper. I promise you it's not. They're actually large not doing that. And no, you will not catch them on top water. But I'll let you all figure out more of the ways to catch them. I throw a jerk bait a lot of the time, but there's other ways to do it too, I assume. Um, and then later in the day, I like when the sun gets up and I like to go find rocky banks and throw a shad wrap. That's what I like to do. Um, 
other guys do other things, but that's mm-hmm. what I like to do. And kind of set it up a little bit more for some of our viewers that probably aren't familiar. So Lake Anna is really in central, would you say c- central Virginia? Kinda, yeah, it's kind of right, right around that area. Um, this is not one of our bigger lakes. I actually threw it up on the board to make sure I got the size right. So it's about 13,000 acres, but I don't know if that counts. This is a di- this is an interesting lake. There's actually a warm water side and a, a considered cold water side. Also private is the warm side, and then the cold water or the normal side is like open to the public. Um, I don't know if the 13,000 acres counts both together. So it's not necessarily like as massive as Kerr or Smith Mountain Lake. It's a, a medium-sized lake kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But because it's so close to D.C. within, you know, you can't, if you fish a tournament there in the summertime, holy crap, the amount of boat, like <laughs> this is, this lake gets very busy very quick. Very quick. So, and that's something I make sure everyone understands when they're thinking of this place. Like it's a very unique fishery with the pressure it gets from being so close to D.C., but yet it can still crank out amazing, amazing sacks of fish bags. now do you think the blueback herring thing do you think that's been a blessing really to actually have that in there now for the fish um, population i think it's definitely making the fish population like larger and then with them putting in i don't remember the exact number but i know at one point it was seventy five thousand f1 florida strains and like anna um and you're starting to see them a lot like in the summertime schooling fish you'll know the difference between a lot of them right now are the ones they put in a couple of years ago were like two pound range You're catching a lot of them in that two pound range i'm curious to see in five to ten years what's going to happen if you watch what happened at smith mountain and the james river mm-hmm. i'm curious to see what's going to happen on lake anna with that yeah and, and because it's like the size of the lake and this is something i i thought was interesting because i fished in college i fished a lot of like i fish like murray i fished kerr i'm not kerr <laughs> kiwi hartwell and to see how the blueback changed the bass behavior because the lake is so small has it helped the tournament pressure where it spreads the anglers out that you're not just beating the bank, you have guys running points and stuff? Does that spread the fields out, or does that concentrate it more? And just general information with that. Do you think um, it's good or bad? It's, you know, I'm seeing it work in both ways. Uh, the guys that like to chase that herring or, you know, topwater bite, you're starting to see them either – and it's hard to say, like, certain sections of the lake, you'll see guys, like, very scattered out. Like, you won't yeah. see many boats. But then there's other sections where people do the top water deal where it's four boats on one point. Good Lord. <laughs> um, or, like, one island, you yeah. know, something like that. And then, like, if you go up the river sections where them guys and the herring don't really venture up there, them guys are pretty grouped up from what I'm, you know, I don't fish up in the rivers much in the summertime. Um but from what I hear from other locals that I know and stuff, they're like, oh, yeah, I had like six boats try to come in on me today on the one dock I was fishing, you know, something like that. So they, I feel like they're getting a lot, you know, more grouped up up there because a lot more guys don't know how to do the herring deal. Mm-hmm. So they're going to fish the shallow deal. That has got to have helped your career immensely, being able to practice the blueback bite. Because if you listen on Fast Talk Live or anything, things, when you got anglers that go to a blueback herring like the first time, it's like, holy crap, this is different. But that's got to help. Oh, it's um, I mean, it's helped me a lot because I fished a lot on Hartwell and Murray and stuff this year, actually. Oh. And um, I finished third on Hartwell this year doing the herring deal. And Murray, mm-hmm. the lake was up when I was there, so I didn't really get on the herring deal well. I stuck with the shallow deal up the river with a buzz bait. But I, tr- I tried the herring deal. I know guys did well on it, but they weren't. It just wasn't happening the way you see the herring deal on that lake, per se, you know. Um, so with Anna, a lot of those places I go to, I've learned like how to run ditches and stuff like that to do that herring deal. And it's helped me tremendously on these other bodies of water. Mm -hmm. What factors play in when you first put on the water and you you talked about breaking that lake down, whether you're going to go down lake, stay in mid lake or go up lake, uh, when you get on the water, what, are there any factors that are, that you're going through your mindset to determine what section of that lake you're going to focus on first? Um, usually I'm one of those people and this is anywhere I go, not just Anna, Mm -hmm. um, I always say I let the Triton tell me where I'm going to go. Uh, when I <laughs> blast right. off, if it leans to the right, I'm going right. If is it leans to the right? left, I'm going there left. Go. But Love that's it. just because I know the lake well enough. But most of the time, really what's going on is there's a pressure in the air, you know, overcast conditions, sunny conditions. If I'm one of the last boats, I see so many guys go down, so many guys go up, right. which way the wind's blowing. All that really determines which way I'm going in okay. the morning. Now, that's just the morning. I'm... I don't ever really get on a really good morning deal. So Mm -hmm. most of the time my morning deal is crap and I move on throughout the day. And that's when I figure out what section I really want to focus on. Gotcha. Okay, good. But that's just me. Other guys I know they get on morning deals and they just unleash on the first thing. So, so being, um, being a smaller lake, 
if you are a, a beginning angler and you're going to go to Lake Anna, because I know I, I teach a lot of kids and they, they go down there for the summertime and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, how would you tell, what would a, a general angler that wants to get into bass fishing in the summertime, what do you think they need to do to have success? Is it very much a timing deal? Like once the jet skiers get out, just stop. It has to be an early morning thing. It, just general information. Um, yeah, for like the beginning angler, yeah, I would say yeah. When you get, which sucks for Anna, is jet skiers get out at nine o'clock nowadays. Yeah. Um, sometimes eight o'clock depending on the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, you want to get on that morning deal more than anything in the summertime for that particular lake. Uh, I actually do better after eleven o'clock in the morning personally. Mm -hmm. Um, but I fish a lot for resident fish in the summer instead of big schools, mm -hmm. just because I don't want to get beat up by all the boat traffic. Um, so if, if it's a beginning angler, just generally want to go out there and catch some fish, I would try to be out there as early as you can in the morning, get on a point down mid lake somewhere and throw a top water and see what happens. Okay. Is there a lot of bank fishing opportunities there for Lake Anna? I think there's, a there's a lot park, of willow right? grass. There's a lot of willow grass up okay. in the mid lake, the upper section, which in the summertime, the fish stay in the grass. They don't ever leave it. I mean, I'm sure you can catch fish out of the dying grass right now, mm -hmm. but I don't personally fish the grass that much because a lot of people do. Yeah, and then this thing too, like, and I want to get into this once we uh, we'll get into it now. The pressure of Lake Anna, and then you growing up there, it's not like a hundred thousand acre place where you can always power fish. You have to learn how to deal and fish with the pressure, which it's got to have helped your bass fishing career. And and talk, I guess if you can talk a little bit about like that, like to be able to go out there and do what you do on Lake Anna constantly. How does that help your mindset, I guess, is where I'm getting at? More your mindset of knowing, like, there's probably been about 10,000 people that have hit this dock, but it, it, it's got to change the way you fish. Um, You know, I'm not trying to sound cocky and nothing like that, but when I think of somebody, 10,000 people hitting that one dock, my mindset goes into, well, maybe one out of that 10,000 people can put the bait where I'm putting mm, it. Good point. Or, yeah. you know, working the bait the way I work it, mm -hmm. you know, so in it. There could be, I'm one of those 10,000 that didn't get bit and somebody coming behind me and catch it. I'm not saying I'm going to be the one that catches it every time, but I that's just my mindset when I approach things like that is, well, did they place the bait where I'm going to be able to place it? Um, did they work the bait slower or as fast as I'm working it? Um, are they throwing a moving bait worm? You know, like, so it just, I, I let the conditions vary that. And then in my mindset, I just try to think, okay, I don't think they've put the bait where I've put it. Mm -hmm. And if I don't get bit, I don't get bit. But if I get bit, I get bit, you know? That is a great point because I don't know how many times you're going down through there and you come up to another boat and you go around and they stick a you know four or five pounder after you've already fished that dock. Yeah. So I think having that right mindset, so you can still fish it. Uh, and your dad taught me too uh, in one of his seminars he did for us to how how to pick apart that dock and not. And you're right, a lot of times we're you know you think about it, we're blowing through it. And you may get two two casts if you're lucky, three. Or are you going to pick? There's probably six, eight, ten, twelve post dock post on there are you going to work that dock are you going to really get back under like you say pick each post at different angles throwing a back angle on the post versus you know the front angle and really dissecting that dock because there's fish maybe further back under that dock that a lot to your point if they don't know how to skip uh, mm -hmm. which is another thing you know to learn to do if you don't to be able to skip those baits you know back under there and fish those areas that a lot of anglers aren't fishing yeah that's a great, great point. Mm, absolutely. And, yeah, because I remember the first time when I went to Kerr, and, and generally growing up in the D.C. area, like you have Lake Anna, you have the Potomac River. They're very much – the Potomac specifically, it's very community. You're always in tight uh, – you're in a tight area with a lot of boats. You go to Lake Anna, it's a smaller like There's going to be boats. First time I went to Kerr for a region, I was like, holy crap, this is an ocean. This is amazing. <laughs> I did that for high school. I thought, this is great. I can have this whole cove to myself. Maybe there's one other boat. But and it got me in a funk mentally because like it changed the way I fish and I think that's always interesting when people that grow up in this area of Jersey when you're so used to literally like a small place and a bunch of boats, it's weird because I think that sets a mindset for us as anglers as, and especially like you know you having a great career so far and, and growing in the sport. Like, do you try to keep the same mindset if you're on Lake Anna versus if you go to Okeechobee or or Hartwell where you have this massive area you feel like oh crap I can find something that I can just drive and keep going or do you try to keep that same lake anna small lake mindset wherever you go um well for example murray this year i'd never been there that was the first time i'd been there so when i got down there i broke it down like i would break down anna i had down lake okay. section i practiced a day and a half down there didn't find nothing 
I practice a day and a half in the mid lake section, and then I practice a day and a half up the river until it got chocolate milk, and I just didn't feel like that time of year being in the chocolate milk was worth it. Mm-hmm. So I just broke it down into three sections, and I practiced, and then my last day of practice was the section I felt like suited me best is what I fished. And with Lake Anna being a lake that has willow grass, docks, offshore structure, you know, herring, all that stuff in it, you can take that what you've learned to find on Lake Anna and move it to a Murray and look for the same kind of structures okay. on that place. So you're trying to find your you're trying to find that Lake Anna mindset wherever you go or what you're comfortable with. Yes, Everybody and go. like when I went to Winya Bay, it got cypress trees, lily pads, tidals. I use that like I did the James River that has cypress trees, lily pads, tidal stuff. Now, when you said offshore structure, it made me think too. Oh, you always hear about uh, brush piles on Lake Anna, and a lot of times guys yes. are putting those out so they know where they are. I've even heard they'll hook onto them and move them. Uh, but what other that how that and obviously you pick it up on your graph. But is there any other ways that you're kind of figured out where guys are usually putting them on like points or off of docks? And then what other specific offshore structures are you looking for? Um, I'm looking a lot for like natural rock out there I, I i'm a big structure fisherman when it comes to fishing offshore i don't like i know guys can go out there and just fish a channel edge and catch mm-hmm. fish but mm-hmm. i i can't i i gotta be throwing at something okay. um and, and i don't know if it's because i gotta have the feeling of something down there okay. I, mm-hmm. I don't know but um a lot of times when you find a brush pile 12 feet deep we'll say and you look at where you've seen that brush pile and if you start finding more brush piles just take a minute and look at your graph mm-hmm. You'll see that all these waypoints you made on brush piles are all on the same contour lines. Okay. So then you can just literally eliminate the whole idling around everywhere, mm-hmm. go to the next spot, idle that one contour, and find more structure. Gotcha. A lot that of these guys sense. are going to do it on the same contour like a lines. Twelve foot depth or 12, something. Twelve, yeah. eighteen, twenty-five yeah. foot. Just look at the mm-hmm. contour lines and where they're located at on the mm-hmm. flats or points, and you'll start finding a lot more. And that offshore fishing too, that's something that is, is hard to for a lot of guys because it's one of those things where you're you're usually positioning your boat right where you need to be fishing. Mm-hmm. And not to say you can't catch them on those docks or, or against the shore, but we, we can relate to that log in the water, that the grass that we can see. It's that offshore stuff that you know, a lot of times, like I say, you're sitting right on those fish yep. and throwing and, and you're saying there's no fish here. Well, you know, being able to back off of that or to look at that twelve to twenty foot water column is, yeah. is maybe yeah. where you're gonna find them. And we had Jeremy on the show um, a little while ago, and, and, and the thing that really struck me is, like, you need to be around a body of water that allows you to practice that skill set. Mm-hmm. You know, him growing up on the James in three feet of water, it's hard to then think about, I'm going to drop shot or, or drag a jig in 50, because mm-hmm. you're not used to it, because you have to have success doing it. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm getting at, w- w- with Lake Anna, especially in, like, in the wintertime, do you just already eliminate water generally speaking going there based on the time of year or do you have an open mindset and just like i'm going to fish a little bit of everything or do you just go there knowing okay it's this time of year i'm going to to start generically in this kind of mindset um every winter is different because last year was really really different um but generally yes i i can go to anna and be like okay it's this time of year they should start being to doing this thing but with it being a power plant lake and you never know when they're going to cut the reactors off, mm. keep them on, what the level's going to be when they cut them off. Because a lot of times when they cut them off, the leg drops. And with all that being said, a lot of times you still got to go out and just fish everything until you figure out exactly what they're on. Mm. So, like, I have areas on Lake Anna, Smith Mountain, Bugs Island that I go to when I first get there. And it's got everything and within 500 yards of each other. That's smart. And okay. I fish that and practice. Okay, well, they're on this stuff. And then I'm able to leave that area, go run the lake, and be like, okay, mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing now. For the, re- for the reactors, I mean, like, if you fish a TVA, there's an app that can tell you what's going on with yes. that. Like, is that something you just stick your finger in the water and you know? Or is there, do you get that, inf- is, it, is it available information, I guess, um, for To that? be honest with you, I don't know. I've been blessed to have people that live over there that okay. tell me when the yeah. reactors are on or off. But... I'm not sure on that one, to be honest with you. Okay. And then generally, is it just a, because you said it drops. Is that a massive drop or is it just a subtle drop in water? In, in the water subtle. Volume? Subtle. Okay. Very subtle. Uh, it, it varies on the water level to begin with, too. Um, I fish a lot on the private side, too. I got buddies that let me fish over there and do stuff like that. And it actually drops tremendously over there compared to oh, the public okay. side. So when I say subtle drop, three, four inches. Got it. And, and just for our viewers at home, because I know there are some people that fish the TVA system. When you say water drop, that might be four or five feet. Compared to this place, the water is generally stable. So, And that's what he's getting back with the reactors, where if those reactors turn off, 
the adjustments aren't probably as extreme, but it still does change the fish behavior. Yeah, oh, big time. And just like a TBA, like Anna's got current. Mm -hmm. When I cut them reactors off, there's no current. Mm. Now, is that current? Because that's, um, so there's like dike one, two, and three. So that current is generally at the lower end, right? Or does that start, how, how would that current kind of? Oh, uh, like... we got a natural current coming out of the rivers because okay. you got the North Anna River. That's a true river. Um, you can get way up in there, actually, believe it or not. Uh, most people don't know you can get a bass boat way up in there. Um, How many lower units have you lost? <laughs> zero. I, you can't get in there with your lower unit, I promise. I've tried. <laughs> well, you get stuck before you get to the point of your motor hitting. <laughs> you got to be on the trolling motor to get in there, but then it drops off. Um, but with the current, it, it's it got a massive, like, you got the natural current coming down, and then you got all the current from the reactors coming out of Dike 3 and making a current on the lower end of the gotcha, lake. Gotcha, okay. Um, so... You just got to – most people don't pay attention to the current because they think it's Lake Anna. Just like Smith Mountain Lake, most mm -hmm. people don't realize there's a current in Smith mm -hmm. Mountain Lake. But there is. When they're pulling water, you know, you got good current. The fish are really, really, really biting. When they're not pulling and they're back pushing back into the lake, they ain't biting whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Um. So with that whole current thing, there's two or three different currents in Lake Anna. And I cannot describe to you exactly where they're all at. I just know when there's current moving and when they're not, mm -hmm. you know. And that's just how I fish it. And a lot of times, too, like if you're looking at the top of a map, I mean, which if you can do some research before you go, too, finding those creek channels, too, and all, all the creek channels and all the coves or the main river you're talking about and seeing where those are maybe meeting a bank or, or hitting an outside bank and that might have a deep dock on it, uh, those are always good areas, too. Like you were talking earlier about finding something that has a little bit of everything in it um, you know, looking at top of a map, sometimes that can also, because uh, that's bringing food in mm -hmm. as well. It's, it's a, oh, yeah. a constant current that you don't, you're on the water, you're looking, you're just seeing the water. You're not thinking, again, we're visual, visual where we're looking at different things, but we're not thinking about uh, that current under the water, maybe 12, 20 foot down that's, you know, moving. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. With, what kind of electronics are you running right now? Hummingbirds. Hummingbirds. So, and, and I'm asking that for, I remember way back when we first talked, it's been a long time, that you were a big-time shallow dock guy. And then now we're just talking about blueback heron and fishing structure and stuff. Like, what was the, what was your learning curve to get to the point where you feel comfortable looking at a screen and trusting it and being like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And maybe you don't make a cast and, and practice, or, or maybe you can just scan it and be like, okay, this is a spot we want. How long did that take you to be comfortable enough when you have money on the line to, to do that? So, um, my first BFL regional was down on Lake Hartwell. I've never, I've been there once or twice, but it was a shallow deal. When we went there for the regional, it was not a shallow deal. I did not know what I was looking at, and I finished like 80th or something in the tournament. Like, I did awful. I, I had a limit boat days, but it was, it was nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, so after that, I kind of took it as a goal of mine to go learn them graphs. I spent that whole winter and you can ask people, I, you know, I got guys on Lake Anna that fish the private side, private side in the wintertime, believe it or not, is the best offshore ledge fishing lake really? in the whole freaking state. Probably. Wow. Um, and I took every weekend, I left my boat at my buddy's Larry's house and every weekend I was at the hot side, learning my grass, fishing 37 to 50 feet deep and just learning what I was looking at, what I was finding, learning what, a white perch looked like on the graph compared to a large mouth or compared to a catfish or what this rock, how far this rock was, what a fish on that rock looks like, you know, stuff like that. And I spent probably, I spent the whole month of December, January and February learning that. And then I've been able to take that to other places and do it again, mm -hmm. you know, across the country. Wow, that's and that's strong. huge to that have a lake strong. like Lake Anna mm -hmm. here in Virginia. So if you do have new electronics and you fish the Potomac or you're in that area, go to Lake Anna. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to try to dial in, dial in your oh, electronics. Definitely. Um, like if you fish a point that you know you felt rock on it, go with your electronics and really dial that thing into what that rock looks like. Mm -hmm. So then you get a better idea of what you're actually fishing. That's what I did with the – so, you know, and I hate saying it's the private side because not many people have access to it, but – an example would be like the private side. I know where fish are there because there's millions of them in that lake that are 12 inches long. <laughs> yeah. You can, I literally went to a spot that you can pull up, catch 25 fish and 25 casts, and I literally just dialed my graphs in to see exactly what them fish look like. And 
what the rock they were on, what if there was a piece of wood down there, I knew what it was and where it was laying and all that stuff. So, and granted, I also had help. I had a guy that everybody knows him around Lake Anna. His name's Matt Martin. He's an unbelievable offshore fisherman. Just can read a graph. I first time I ever heard he could look and tell you how big a fish was on a stump on his side You're scan. You're kidding. I didn't believe it. We went to Smith Mountain Lake. He goes, there's a three-pounder on that stump. I said, no, there ain't. He said, yeah, there is. Fired Carolina rig over and caught a three-pounder off that stump. I kid you not. But That is freaking awesome. To have that, who I also, I fished the Elite 70s with him. So to have that kind of shorten my learning curve a little bit on what to really look at and look for. So that, that definitely helped with that. But for a beginner that wants to do it, go to Lake Anna. Find a point. Find anything like you can literally idle straight out of Anna Point Marina, and there's a roadbed that everybody knows about right there that's nothing but rock, and you can graph that until you get it dialed into what you want to see. How, do you like do you like a lot of static in your in your graphs where so you're picking up almost everything, or do you want a, a certain amount of clarity to it when when you dial it in? If, you, if you're a beginner, like how would you have them dial it in? Um, well, it depends on the graph. It really does. Uh, with a, I've worked with all the graphs. I've ran all the graphs. Um, I'm sticking with Hummingbird now just because I truly enjoy those. But with like a Lowrance, if you want your 2D to be right most of the time, their 2D comes straight out of the box pretty good. You don't really have to mess mm -hmm. with it too much. Um, with Hummingbirds, if you want your 2D to be right, most of the time you got to jack the sensitivity up so freaking high you would think you're doing something wrong. <laughs> and you got to have the contrast pretty much eliminated. It's, it's awful. But once you get it down, you can see everything. Mm -hmm. Um, with Garmin's, Garmin's 2D, usually you got to tweak the sensitivity up a little bit and drop the contrast to 40. But typically, if you read anything about graphs like Lawrence's and Garmin's and Hummingbird's, they'll tell you to have your sensitivity at 12 and your contrast at 9 or 7. Okay. And that's a good starting point. And this is with 2D, right? With not your the, 2D. Not the D now, with your side scan, usually if you're idling... You want to generally, like Lowrance, you're going to have to tune it in a little bit more. Hummingbird, they come pretty good straight out of the box. Okay. Um, with Garmin, I haven't used the side scan on Garmin so much, but I do know you have to tweak it a little bit more. And then the biggest thing with graphs is, like, my dad is partially colorblind. You have to have hmm. your template where you can see it. It's mm. Some people don't understand that even though, like, oh, it's just a different color. No, it's really to help you be able to see stuff. Like for me in the overcast days, I have to put my template as like a lime green color because I can see stuff better when it's overcast. When it's sunny, I have it as a brown color. I change that stuff too and it helps you see things mm -hmm. uh, where people wouldn't believe just the color change helps you see it. That's, that's yeah. I never even thought of that too, like using the color palettes to help make it more contrast to your eye specifically. Yeah, it helps you see shadows better when overcast days or sunny days. Um, and it doesn't give you false shadows than like, a lot of times, on people think some of the best days to graph would be go out there on a bright, sunny day, but then you're getting false shadows. Mm. My favorite time to graph, like when I went to Murray, I put in the water at 5 o'clock in the morning every day for practice to go graphing because it was still dark out. That is smart. That's, That's really smart. I was going to say, the hard part is you're wanting to fish. I mean, you yeah. <laughs> you got to literally take the time not fish, but uh, you know, really to work yeah. on the graph, dedicate to the graph. Yeah. The problem, a lot of us get on the water if you don't fish a lot you're you're wanting to fish yeah. oh yeah and the biggest thing is uh if you want to go graphing and learn your graphs don't bring a rod yeah that's right don't bring a rod that's what i did for months and it killed me but it worked out in the end i think so what what is what is your setup uh with your graphs um are you running uh their version of live scope are you running just 2d are you having the down imaging on your on your front like how do you like to set up your boat i have well as of right now, I only got one graph in the back and one graph up front. I'm getting the 360 from Hummingbird up front because, again, I'm a structure fisherman. The mm -hmm. 360 suits me better. Um, my partner, Matt, on his boat we fish out of, he's got 360. So I've learned a lot. Like I've learned that that's what I want. Mm -hmm. So as a beginner, if you got buddies out there that has that stuff, go out fishing with them. See if that's something truly you want on your boat. Because I've fished with the live. I like the live. I see where the live can come into play. But I don't want it on my boat. It's not. It's gonna hurt me. And that's some. I, I I have to. One thing that I've always like, and you listen to the debate stuff about how lives go affecting fishing. You going to these big time tournaments, like uh, mentally, or do you feel at a massive disadvantage if you're like, I'm not gonna use the live scope? Or do you feel like you know what? It it it's a nice tool, but it's not like if you don't have it. 
you're going to fail. And so for the people at home, you don't necessarily maybe have to spend six grand for it to go out there and, and have success. Correct. I personally, I used a buddy's boat once that had live on it and I was on fish and practice with that live. I waited in six fish in two days. Really? They would follow it and follow it. And then you get so committed into these fish <laughs> following your bait. You won't leave and adjust. Mm, so addicting, it hurts me. Yeah. It, that it's just like bed fishing. You spend hours on one fish you see on the live scope, and then it doesn't bite. Yeah, people don't talk about that at all. Like thinking about that, it's like bed fishing, where it's yeah. like you can just follow this video game, and you yeah, you can't and, stop. and sometimes <laughs> they don't bite. When they don't bite, you don't do well. Mm. And so for me, I just want the three sixty so I can see because you can still see fish on that moving around and doing stuff. It's not like the live. But say the school's over here and your boat drifts just a little bit, you can see the school moved over here. Mm -hmm. And you can stay following those fish in that aspect. But I'm not seeing what them fish are doing or reacting to my bait. So if I don't get bit in five minutes, I'm gone. I'm going to go find the next school. Whereas, that is smart. Okay, yeah. You know, whereas the live, you're watching them fish react to your bait. And, yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes you can get it right in front of their face and really get them to bite. And there's days that that live scope is just unbelievable and people win a lot of money doing it. But as an angler like me that travels around – the country doing stuff you can't fall into those traps a lot of times when you don't have as much time on the water as like local guys at your local lakes that is yeah that is that just blew my mind because yeah if you're running six offshore spots and you have live scope you can quickly scan and be like they're here and you're going to spend more time on each one versus you you could randomly say i'm going to give it five minutes and i'm gone because you don't visually get to see that their fish stack there so you're just going based on are they going to bite or not i'm as my buddies say we're looking for giant suicidal bags <laughs> so if they don't want to eat right away i'm not going to spend right. time on them that is yeah that's yeah. a great that's how you take it and make it a tool mm -hmm. and i never thought of it that way before like yeah you're not going to just get honed into something because you can see it you're moving you're looking for fish that actually want to play ball. And i think the challenge too is you got two different you got the instinctive anglers which don't yeah. even like them at all and they're going on instincts and then you have the ones like you're talking about video game they're just going to dial in they're they're looking at that screen that's all they're doing and i think it's being able to find that happy medium where you're going to probably go on instinct mm -hmm. but you'll still use that tool like you're saying as as you know when you're not getting it well they are here but not yeah not being yeah. committed either way kind yeah. of meshing those two together yeah like the you know where i think the live will come into big play and what you've seen on like bass masters and stuff with patrick walters he's the expert at doing that everybody knows that when he won on the saint john's this year he was using his 360 to find stumps mm -hmm. pointing right. his live scope at those stumps because they were offshore but they're only in four or five foot of water and there's fish spawning on them mm -hmm. so he was that's how he was sight fishing interesting those fish. They were on beds on these stumps, so he would find it on the 360, move the live scope to it, and pitch over there and catch the fish. That's almost like crappie fishing almost. Crazy. <laughs> That's, crazy. That's the only time where I think I would personally want the live. When you're out there chasing herring fish, and sometimes the herring fish aren't ready to fire. Mm -hmm. You're going to sit there and watch them the whole time, and you're not going to catch them. Yeah. Whereas you pull up to 10 different spots, don't get bit, re keep rotating them instead of sitting there watching the fish chase your bait and not bite, you'll eventually you'll time up everything and they fire. Yeah, and just you I just I love what you said. Like there's an addiction there. If you could always just watch everything swimming down there, the discipline it, it, like a Patrick Walters has to be like, I'm gonna leave this because it's not working. Man, if I didn't see that, I probably wouldn't have spent so much time there. But like mm -hmm. that can really pull you the wrong way yes. if you can stare at all that stuff. I learned the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> and I that's the only reason I I wouldn't get it. It's just because I've used it once in a tournament, well, twice in a tournament now, and it, it backfired. It, mm -hmm. it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. Now, I've used it also, like, at Hartwell this year in practice. I had I was part, uh, practicing with a buddy who had it. I got to watch a six-pounder eat a crankbait out of a cane pile, and that was the coolest thing that's ever. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> but, you know, like, that that's the one beneficial of knowing, okay, there was five fish in that cane pile, and I was able to fire over there. Now, Hartwell would be a different story for me with the live because I could pull up to the cane pile and be like, okay, there is fish in this cane pile. Mm -hmm. But if they don't bite, you got to have the discipline to leave mm -hmm. and go to the next the one. The discipline part. That, mm -hmm. I feel like we keep coming back to that. And I feel like this is talking about strategy and stuff. And, and what do you feel like the strengths of your game are right now? Or let me rephrase it another way. What would you, what would you most likely want to do in a tournament if you had your wherewithal? Do you want to be 50 feet out there or do you in the, in the middle of nowhere? Or do you want to be up, up shallow? Mm, that's a tough one because I've, <laughs> I've come to really like being out there in the 50 foot of water range because it's fun to watch them on the grass, eat that, like, you know, dropping down and watch them come up and eat it. But 
I'm true to the shallow game. I'd rather be up <laughs> on cypress trees, boat banging against roots and stuff, and just fishing a chatterbait or a frog up really shallow. That's that's what I like to do. I, I rather staying do with your roots. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I rather do that. Like Murray, like a good example of that was Murray. Was I tried that offshore game and I tried it and tried it and tried it. Well, finally third day of practice, I said screw this. Picked up a buzz bait, went shallow, and caught a four pounder. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm I'm sticking with this the rest of the time. And it, it you know, I didn't win the tournament, but I was able to finish twenty fourth and get a check down there. So. It, just sticking with the roots helped out there, whereas I could have been like the other guys that wanted to chase that herring deal and it didn't work mm-hmm. out. I have something I want to get into. What, what do you got next in the docket? No, I was just thinking too. You know, when you know, think about you are a competitive angler too, and I'm assuming you know with your dad, uh, like you said, a lot of people know your dad, Jeff Luger, uh, former Virginia Bass Nation. He since moved to Texas, um, but he was a uh, Bassmaster uh, Classic two, two, two time times. qualifier. You know, that's and, awesome. And, and, a lot of people can say that, so that's pretty awesome. So I'm, I'm assuming that he had some influence uh, with your competitive uh, fishing desire. Growing yeah, up. yeah. He um, just watching him mm-hmm. growing up, like going to weigh-ins and stuff. It really made me want to be a tournament angler. I started fishing tournaments with him when I was seven okay. on wow. Egypt Bend. Wow. We used to fish tournaments on Egypt Bend together and Lake Anna together and stuff like that. And um, a lot of locals know Egypt Bend. You know, mm-hmm. it's a fun little right. place to fish. Um, and growing up, like I, we fished a lot of tournaments together and then he fished the, which is no longer a club anymore, but extreme bass anglers. Mm-hmm. And whenever he needed a sub, him or his partner needed, mm-hmm. you know, to be a sub, I would go in and oh, fish yeah. with them and do stuff like that. But, uh, when I turned like 13, we quit fishing tournaments mm-hmm. together. He didn't hmm. want me fishing with him anymore. When I can kind of see too, you're not really, you're not a shadow of him. You're your own person, your own angler. And I think the influence was there. Oh yeah, it definitely really got the start going. You know, it got the start going and broke off. So you've also been you've been both the boater and a co angler. Yes. Uh, through your thing, so maybe just talk to that too, because yeah. a lot of guys have gotten gotten into the competitive side, and there is definitely a different uh, fishing style, whether mm-hmm. you're on the front of the boat or the back of the boat. So maybe just start with the the co angler side of it, your experience with that, and uh, how you had success, because it's definitely different when you're not in control and fishing off the back versus the front maybe talk about each of those as you grew up to the point where you're at now um first thing i'm going to say about the whole deal if you want to get into tournament fishing and you want to learn be a Mm co-angler you have to be a co-angler it's teaches you so much more it teaches you what not to do Mm -hmm. it teaches you how to run a boat because some guys don't know how to run a boat and you got to be willing to take that risk being a co-angler to be in the boat with them Mm -hmm. but it teaches you how to do things that you wouldn't think, you know, just jumping in a boat, being a boater would mm-hmm. just, you know, like it just teaches you other things of the sport. That's a great point. Um, it teaches you how to be kind to somebody else, honestly. Like if you get a kind boater, you know, when you become a boater, it's like you want to be kind to your mm-hmm. co-angler because yeah. you had that in return. Right. Um, but on the co-angler side, as the fishing aspect comes, uh, you got to be open-minded. Like mm-hmm. I'm talking, don't ever go in a boat without having a spinning rod because mm-hmm. um, – Anywhere you go in the country, it doesn't matter if you're fishing two foot of water, 50 foot of water, you can throw a spinner rod and catch 12 inches. Right. And on the co-angler side, 10 pounds a lot of times, you do really well. Hmm. So if you can catch 10 pounds a day, that was my mindset if it was a five fish limit. Now, you know, you got tournaments out there that are three fish limits. And my goal was a three fish limit was six pounds. You catch six pounds, that's three two pounders, you're doing well. You're going to be, you catch that every day, you're going to do really well in the tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, five fish limit, you catch 10 pounds a day, you might win it or you're going to do really well. Mm-hmm. There's going to be always the guy that catches 15. Mm-hmm. And if you were that guy that day, by all means, be happy. But right. most of the time, if you can catch 10, you're doing well. Wow. What is the mindset change going from being a co-angler to being the guy that runs a boat? There's got to be a different a mental strategy and approach because it's so – if you're a co-angler, and I remember I, I did a, I got my started too being a co-angler, you just kind of, it almost feels like you're part of a charter. You just get your stuff, yeah. and you're just worrying about yourself. What kind of mental hurdles was there, or was there any, when you finally made the switch to being a boater? Let me say too, when I can remember watching one of the weigh-ins, Bassmaster, and I don't remember who you're with or body water, but I remember the boater 
his comment at the weigh-in was tough because they were and you were uh, might have been the one you won. I think you end up winning. It was neck and neck, and they brought you guys up last. Oh, that was my first national championship okay. at Pickwick. I okay. finished really? second in that and one. I remember the boat. I was leading that when first he came day. Up, he said, "This kid can fish. He is a good stick." And I thought, "Wow, that says something." Yeah. You know that. You know, and uh, I anyways, actually was hanging yeah. out with him at Louisiana this year. Really? Saying, really? Yeah, yeah. He made it again. <laughs> so, but um. The mindset to going to the boater thing, as you were saying, was I had already fished a club being a boater. So it wasn't mm-hmm. really a hurdle for me. Uh, it was a team deal. Me and my best friend fished together, grew up fishing together. Um, I always ran the boat, you know, did all that stuff. And we he, he would run the boat too, don't get me wrong. Like, we both would take turns. We were both on the front deck. But just the aspect of being able to already be in that small club. So I... I try to encourage many young anglers to join a local club like Shenandoah mm-hmm. Valley. Like mm-hmm. that's a great club. I turned a lot of the extreme guys over to y'all mm-hmm. uh, when they were texting me about what clubs to join. Mm-hmm. Um, just because those little club tournaments, like y'all, y'all travel mm-hmm. Chickahominy, James, mm-hmm. wherever, you know, like you learn these yeah. bodies of water and you get to be a boater, but you're doing it with not fishing for hundred thousand dollars. You're doing mm-hmm. it fishing for bragging rights and 500 bucks, mm-hmm. you know, like, it, getting it, it, yeah. You're getting experience. You're yeah. getting experience doing it. You're not mm-hmm. really in a total loss. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my leap was like, okay, so, and then coming from the co-angler side to the boater side for like the BFLs, being the co-angler, I knew what I wanted to do for the guy back there. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew, like, I wanted to position the boat so he could fish. Like, we go to Potomac. I had one, I'll tell you all a story. I had one time I was fishing a spillway on Potomac, and I was smashing them. I go to that spillway first day. I looked at my co-angler. I said, man, you're going to be backboated. It's just what I got to do to fish this. Mm -hmm. I said, let me get a good limit. I'll spin the boat around. We'll get you a good limit. We'll move on. I rolled up there. I caught 13 pounds. I spun the boat around. He caught 11, and we moved on. (laughs) And it was was a great time. He ended up finishing fourth in the event. I finished seventh. So, you know, and then there's other times where, and I'm saying this because I've had the same thing on the same spillway where the guy was a dick to me. Mm-hmm. And after I caught my good limit, I let him catch one fish and I was gone. You know, so. Yeah, good for you, though. That's pretty yeah, cool. Because you could, yeah, just pick up. I'm going on the next one. Yeah. But uh, you're still considering. But it goes back to what you said earlier. When you've been on the back, you know what that's like and how that yeah. feels. And so you're going to you're gonna treat them a little bit differently yeah. as a boater. Because, yeah, no, that's cool. Being fair with that. Yeah. But I've also heard, too, where guys, when you are coming up empty, sometimes it is that guy does also have some experience or say, Hey, let's, you know, let's try this and being open to that. Next thing you know, that also, you know, in some cases um, could benefit you. As you were talking yeah. about the Pickwick tournament mm-hmm. just a minute ago, that day, I'll never forget. We ran, he had 18 pounds the first day on four fish with an eight pounder. And the guy leading the tournament was 50 yards down the grass line from him. We went down there in five minutes. He caught a five pounder. Wow. I hadn't got bit. He catches two more shorts, looks at me and goes, something's not right. I was like, well, I got an idea if you want to go do it, because I was leading day one, and I, my me and my boater both had a limit day one. So he said, all right, let's do it. We ran back up there, and 10 minutes later, I had a, what what I thought was a limit. I will clarify that in a minute. <laughs> and he caught uh, three more, gave him four fish, and he ended up making day three because of those three more. Wow. And when I say I thought I had a limit, we measured one in the harbor for about 10 minutes and realized I don't think it was a keeper, and I ah. threw it back damn and um you know but i still made day three he made day three and so that's where as you were saying sometimes your co-angler will teach you what to do throughout the day um i've had it this year too in the bfls where one time smith mountain i struggling struggling when you know Mm -hmm. head spinning big bass (laughs) tour was going on boats every freaking inch of the lake and my co-angler goes dude you were catching fish when you were fishing slow why don't you slow down? Wow. Mm. Ten minutes later, I put 14 pounds in the boat, and he caught a four-pound smallie to get him second in the Isn't tournament. That something? That's cool. And you brought him a cold one right after <laughs> that pep talk. <laughs> so, you know, it was like you, sometimes you just got to listen to mm. everybody. Don't just – just always keep that open mm. mind. That's how I fish, mm. and I encourage people to fish that way, but mm. some people just – they do want to do their own thing, and I, by all means do it. Mm. So you've trans- transitioned into that boater role, and then you've taken another step now too. Uh, talk about that, about uh, your decision to enter the Open. Um, I wasn't going to. Mm-hmm. I really wasn't. And uh, I might get emotional here. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to, but my girlfriend encouraged me so much That's to awesome. do it. 
she uh, supported me so much on it. She was like, you need to do it. So now I'm moving in with her and she wants me to do it so bad. The support is unreal. Like right now she's taking care of my damn dog while I'm up here with y'all. Um, so she's probably going to kill me for talking about her. No, um, she's <laughs> she's her. Yeah. If she's encouraging you to go So I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to do it at all. We had talked about it. I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to do the BFLs again. I'm going to do the Bass Why Nation. Is that? Um, like what was your reason not to? Financially, I didn't think yeah. I could because it's a lot of money to it do is. the traveling. It's and, yeah. um, it's, it was hard for me thinking, you know, like I, I don't have a great paying job. I don't, you know, nothing like that. So it was hard for me to comprehend doing $5,400 to <laughs> fish wow. yeah. the opens, sure. you know, um, and having to pay it all out of pocket. Um, so that's why I got emotional is because she wants to help with everything with it That's and great. you know for me to be able to go do that and chase that dream it, mm -hmm. it means a whole lot that's awesome that yeah. really is that you know um because yeah it's not an easy decision mm -hmm. both financially but also the time commitment because like you were saying earlier too it's not just about the day of the tournament or the no, three-day tournament the week before you know pre preparation planning going into it i mean we were talking about that earlier to have expenses of your boat, your motor, your gear, all this, all these graphs, and just the, the fishing equipment, all, everything, and the lodging, and the travel, and it's, I mean, it's, it's a major, major commitment. Oh yeah. And um, and and I think most fishermen they do it for the love, the passion of fishing, because we like to fish, and then the competitive side of it. Um, but man, I think that's awesome that yeah. you know you're able to uh, for her to encourage you to do that, and that you're stepping out to do that. You know, you can maybe prove something to yourself, prove something to others, or whatever that case may be. So. Um, so what, so going into this, what do you, what did you decide on what division and then what, um, um where I, are you going? What's your first stop? I decided on the Northern division mm -hmm. because that first stop is in my backyard. Okay. So on the James river, I go. love that place. I've awesome. done well there. I'm excited for that one. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second one's on Oneida. I've never been there and I like fishing mm -hmm. offshore. I like fishing for smallies, you know, doing stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I'm excited to go up there, and you never know. Might go up grass fishing with a frog for some large yeah. <laughs> Um And then the third stop, I've been to the Upper Bay a couple times, and I enjoy the Upper Bay. It suits what I really like to do. I've done okay up there. Um, I have never been a boater up there, so mm -hmm. knowing what I've learned and what I've seen practicing up there, I've got a good idea for that time of year what to do when I get there. So I'm excited about that. It's tidal. I get to fish dirt shallow. It's going to be a good time. When's the James tournament? Uh, April 14th through the 16th. I'm going to have to watch out for that. Yeah. That one will be. So, and then, and then I think really the two things, if you want to tackle these dreams, is you need to have a, a, a financial business plan and idea, but then you also need to find the support of family mm -hmm. and loved ones. And mm -hmm. a clearly, you know, your girlfriend is really being your rock here to help you. And that's so important to have those people in your life. Oh, yeah. From from the business side of the, uh, financially, um, what what are your sponsors like? So when you made this decision, was this something where it was just between you and loved ones and family? Did you bring in the sponsors to talk about it? Like talk about the business side of that. Um, well, the begin with it was I wasn't going to do it, like I said, and then she looked at me and called me crazy and was like, "You need to do it." Um, so then I talked to my dad because I I got to thinking like. I can afford it. Mm -hmm. I've saved up the money to do it. I can afford it. I'm going to go broke doing it type deal. And, you know, but I'm going to try, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you got to, you, you, I'm young. You still got to try. Mm -hmm. um, so I talked to my dad. My dad thought it was a great idea to go ahead and make that next step. He thinks I was ready. And for him to say that, you know, with the levels he's fished, it made, you know, it helped with my yeah. decision. Um, I talked to some other, my mom and some other people about doing it and stuff like that. And it started with the family. And then as I started with the family and made that announcement that I was going to do it, the business side came about. Okay. Mm -hmm. I started getting phone calls from people and stuff wanting to put me on pro staff, do some sponsorship deals. Like I have gentlemen that's going to wrap my boat now, you know, stuff like that. Um, started coming about and so then that now it's like you don't get any sleep you're just sitting there on the phone constantly That's crazy. about business stuff and, and so before this decision i mean you were fishing let's see the bfl's right you yep. were fishing um bat, bass regional events correct correct and you had a sponsor base so then almost the announcement of you fishing the opens did that actually bring more sponsorships it, or, or, or magnet toward you 
It did, and I will have to say, um, my buddy Frederick, he's a great buddy of mine. He actually, without me saying a word to him, I'm I'm gonna call him my number one fan. He's gonna <laughs> he's gonna cuss me later for this one, but I don't care. We talk three times a week, you know, just talking. And he was part of the conversation about doing the opens. He was like, "Dude, you need to do it. You're you're, you're gonna do well. You need to do it." So, I get a phone call two days ago. Frederick had three people that wanted to sponsor me, the guys that want to wrap my boat, the guys that want to wow. pay for Jersey, want to give me some extra money to help finance wise. And that was just, it just started bringing in more when I made that announcement. Did I ever think that was going to happen? No. Okay. Um, I, my thoughts were, okay, I'm going to pay this out of pocket. Hopefully I do well and I can at least bring some money back in. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that side and friends and family helping, reaching out to people that I never expected anybody to do this, um it's definitely brought in the sponsorship after the announcement because that's a big level i mean that's a top guys that fish that trail across the country Mm -hmm. so um that's the only i I mean i really don't know it was just like all of a sudden i started getting random phone calls and it was people wanting to help out with the whole thing what's the right decision because because of your age you're young and yet you're and you're, you're experienced um and the thing about it too is you'll never if you had not made that decision You'd have grown up and you already said, what if? Yeah. If yeah. I what would have it. done it, you, you don't want to say that. You don't have any regrets. And Correct. So by, I think by doing it, mm-hmm. you're going to go into it, and uh, and we'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. What So as you talk about James being in your backyard and then these other what – are, what are you going to do? How do you prepare for the tournaments – uh, leading up to pre-fishing and then pre-fishing a tournament, how do you how do you break something like that down? How do you start bur- like James is in your backyard, and then also you talked about water you haven't been on. What are some things you're going to do to prepare for that? Well, I've already started preparing now. Right. Um, I've never been to Oneida. That's the mm-hmm. one place. Mm-hmm. I've Google mapped it. I've pulled up Navionics on it. I've mm-hmm. watched every video you can imagine on YouTube that has anything to do with fishing, which it's hard to find fishing videos for right. bass on Oneida. Um, you know, I've watched all that mm-hmm. stuff just to get an idea of what to look for. Right. And my dad's been there, so that helps, too. I've mm-hmm. talked to him about, like, mm-hmm. what to look for and um, what the fish will be doing that time of year when mm-hmm. I get there and stuff like that. So to have all the resources we mm-hmm. have nowadays right. is what right. – so for prepa- for preparation, I like I said, I'm starting now. I've Navy honest everything. Mm-hmm. I've Google Earth everything. I've – I could tell you where every shoal on that lake is right now just because I have literally done all that. I have a map that I have drawn out where I'm going to go first start graphing mm-hmm. at. And then when I get there, I only have one tournament in June. Okay. So I'm going to leave somewhere mid-June um, and go up for four or five days and just get my feet wet and mm-hmm. understand what mm-hmm. I'm really about to go into. Right. Because I know that place, if it blows out the east or the west, mm-hmm. 10 mile an hour, you got four footers. Mm-hmm. It, it can be brutal. So... I just want to see what I'm about to go mm-hmm. get myself into mm-hmm. first. So with that, because I just brought it because I was gonna make sure about the dates and everything. So you got like you got smallmouth perfection in July, but then you get to have a fun time on the title. Let's see where is it? Oh, there it is. So the Chuck Prochesta like September. So you're basically that's kind of nice that you get to pin it with title to begin with, title at the end. I, is that open tournament up north? Is that going to be the big? If you get over that, you're going to feel. Well, like okay i have a chance and then honestly what is your first time we asked jeremy this what is success to you because the one thing i complain about is if you're not the number one angler in the bass open you deem Mm -hmm. yourself a failure but let's say you finish top 20 out of the greatest angler okay that's pretty that's pretty cool Mm -hmm. for your first year doing it like what to you and maybe you haven't thought of this yet what is success like what Mm -hmm. what would you after this year be like you know what damn that was freaking awesome Mm -hmm. well I fished against, you know, with that Elite 70 trail we got in Virginia, you got Proznik, you got them guys you're fishing against. Like, I have fished against pros. So, in my mind, success would be, yes, top 10 in the points. That would be freaking awesome. Um, But I want that top three spot. Mm -hmm. That's an Elite Series berth. I want it. But right now, I'm going to take it one tournament at a time. My goal is to finish top 20 in each of the three events. And that'll give you a legitimate shot at the points. So I'm not even going to worry about the points. I didn't this year at all about the BFLs. I didn't even realize how bad I was. Like, I, I didn't realize I had a 25-point lead going into the last one on Potomac. I, I quit looking. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it until the guy told me that, that morning, hey, it looks like you're leading the points when I was going through boat check. I was like, great, now that's on my mind. I got to go fishing. 
Um, so I'm not going to worry about the points. I'm literally going to focus each tournament at a time because I also got two other trails I'm fishing, and I'm going to go every weekend at a time. What, and just what move is your on. overall schedule right now? What do you got on the books tournament wise next year? Uh, Bass Nation. I'm fishing Bass all the Nation. state. That's going to be four. Good lord. Okay, you got one, that. One, two, three. Three state qualifiers, state championships. So yeah, four events. Um, elite seventies. That's five events. And then the and opens. then the three opens. Good lord. Is there any conflict right now, or nope. is it all good? Okay. They're all good. I actually got the schedule in my phone right now. Um, yeah, because we start in March. Gaston for the Bass Nation. March twenty sixth, Smith Mountain for Elite seventies. April. Ninth, the Saturday before I start practicing for the Open on the James, is Gaston for the Elite Seventies, then the Open, and then the weekend after the Open, I'm on Anna for the Elite Seventies, and then it's so on and so forth all the way through Goodness the gracious. year. Well, what does work think about all this? Have you gotten that all squared up to where that there's no problem with that, or yeah, my so. I'll put it this way. My boss told me if I could uh, find somebody to help pay for the Opens, he would let me have three weeks off of vacation this year. So I found somebody to help pay for the Opens. Wow. And he was like, yeah, you got three weeks. Go for it. It's that support system. That's cool. You've yeah. you got to have it to make a dream happen. That's right. That's pretty awesome. Pretty amazing. What's your favorite body of water? Um, in Virginia? Mm-hmm. Or anywhere. Anywhere? Or do you both? One in Virginia, one anywhere. My favorite in Virginia is by far the James River. Hmm. I love that place. Yeah, I've, so you're a title I love guy. It. I love that place. You're a title guy. Then. Oh yeah, big you time. Gotta be. Yeah, that, that is very a lot much. Of so talk about that a little bit though, real quick. Then uh, title water, because I mean, we were talking about this earlier. Guys that aren't familiar mm-hmm. or haven't fished it growing up can sometimes struggle with miss that. so uh, many people when they get on there. Um, I just like the challenge of knowing, figuring out what tides they want to bite on, and then figuring how to run them tides. So it's enjoyable to me. And then you get to fish shallow the whole time. You don't have to, you don't even have okay. to turn the graphs on. Half time, I don't even put my front graph on the boat when I'm on the James. <laughs> um, or any tidal rivers. A lot of times I'll even take transducer off so I can beat the tar out of my trolling motor. Um, I'm one of those people who uses a boat as a tool, not just as a clean, <laughs> clean boat. My boat's not in that's, great shape. Right. Um, so just knowing like where to go on what tides and then figuring out. So, so do you have a favorite tide as well? Ooh, it depends. Springtime, it's usually I like low tide the best on spring because when they're spawning, you can catch them a lot better off beds when it's right. low tide. Um, summertime, a lot of times I like high tide because usually I'm so far back in the creeks, I got to have high tide yeah. to get where the fish are. Mm-hmm. And um, anytime the tide's moving, really, mm-hmm. you have good bites. But I would have to say overall favorite, high tide. I remember time. Nolan telling me too that's kind of basically trying to find those areas that support that, you know, falling to low tide or, or rising to high tide, you know, because it may be a different area, different creek, or different, you know, place um, that will be able to put fish in the boat. Uh, yeah. Finding those places out, I guess. I mean, it's definitely a lot more to yeah. think about when you throw in that tidal factor. It's it's a it's a math equation to me in my head, so okay. I, I enjoy it. And it's interesting you said milk run because I've heard Ike talk about that, but I've also heard um, on other shows where they talk about how people from up north in really grassy areas or Florida that understand the idea when you're fishing grass, there's that camping aspect that you get in a good area and you wait them out. They do extremely well on tides, and I feel like there are there are these two really opposing ideologies, and they work both. Where we we milk run it, mm-hmm. or we just mm-hmm. camp and work they through all the tides. When, once the tide changes, then they'll they'll turn on. Yeah. Are all tidal fisheries the same? And what I mean is, you've been to Winyah Bay, the Potomac, the James. Are are different fisheries more favorable for a milk run versus camping, or is that just a that's your strategy? No matter where, if it has tide, this is the strategy I use. Um. I'm a big running and gunning guy. I can, I'm can. i so antsy, I cannot sit in one spot for very long. <laughs> I've tried the whole camping thing out, and then, no, yeah. not for me. Not for me. I end up leaving and hurting myself. So um, I've just become accustomed to running the tide. That's okay. how I like to fish. Uh, Ike and Ellie, you said his name. He's one of my favorite anglers. I grew up watching him. I love the way he ran the tide on the Delaware River when he won it's that one at 14. Yeah. That is what I try to do on the James River. And it's last year it worked out really well. This year it could come up shy. You know, you never he know. He also won the James. Recently. Yeah, he like won the James in 16. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm kind of a bass geek. I, I know everybody that won the James <laughs> um, all the way like, through. <clears throat> do you have like a – do you keep a watch of, of – how do you keep the time? Like I even think you said Winyah Bay where those guys are making like 200-mile-ass runs like down there. 
how do you keep it all in your head? Do you keep it on your phone? Like, okay, yesterday it took me three hours to get here to blah, blah, blah. Like, how do you keep that all straight in your head with uh, the tide fluctuating like every other, like every day? Um, so like, for example, the James, a lot of times you got, like, I'll run to the chick, mm-hmm. but I end up in the James. So what I do is, you know, obviously you figure out where the fish are in practice first. Yeah. But a lot of times the tide will be t- totally different in the chick before you get to the James. But the time might not be right until like one o'clock in the James for what you want to fish. And, but it's right at nine o'clock in the chick. So are you timing it? So if, if you think the perfect thing's at one, do you want to be there right at one? Or are you like, I want to get I want to be there here early because you never early? know okay. if the wind yeah. or the moon phases will affect the tide mm-hmm. coming in earlier or later. So you're thinking you're giving yourself that buffer time. Um, yeah, the, the buffer plans. time. Yeah. That's insane. I don't know how the hell you do So that. Uh, a good Lord. example for it was the Elite 70s this year on the James. I ran to Chip Oaks to begin with. I had one spot. I knew with the dead low tide down there first thing in the morning I could catch eight pounds. Mm-hmm. The limit, you know, real quick. It worked out. I went down there. I caught eight pounds. I told my buddy if we get a kicker, it'll be one over six. I ended up catching a six-pounder down there. Well, we fished there till we kind of waited it out, fished down there till about 10 o'clock. And I knew at 10 o'clock the tide was going to be right once I got – up the river to where my main stuff was and i ended up i I actually i don't even think we fished till 10 o'clock i think we left at nine because i looked up in the marsh bank and it was already starting to get flooded and i left and ran up the river and it worked out we ended up catching 18 and a half pounds up there and finishing in the top 10 in that event but like you were saying just running knowing where Mm -hmm. to be at on those certain tides and knowing how to time it from where you're at on the river is what I personally like to do. Because then you're talking like massive distances. Yeah, you're oh, yeah, I'm talking 20, rivers, mile, yeah. I mean, 20, 30 mile runs. I was runs. surprised to hear you say James because the chick is, a lot of people love the chick because there's so much variety on the chick that you won't find on the James with the cypress trees. and. Yeah, um, yeah and for our fans to know, so this is the chick, and usually because of bass, <laughs> they don't decide to have the tournament there. So you guys are running your ass from like way up here, correct? Oh, like uh, keep going. Good God. <laughs> Keep going. You're, not, you're nowhere near it yet. Oh, my God. Keep going. Guys, do you under, like, that's insane. Keep going. Up here? Um, Holy crap. Yeah, all right, <laughs> zoom in right, zoom in right, and go down a little bit, right, uh, okay. Right in this area? Um, Let's see here. I'm looking for the pit. <laughs> okay. That looks like, uh, which bridge is that? Uh, that is. The 295 or whatever, 288, no? Yeah, that, that that's the that's the 150. 150, okay, yeah, go down about. Oh my God, that's insane! All right, there's the first pit up there. Keep going down. Keep going down. All right, right there, that pit you see right there. Uh, what's it say? Uh, Title oh, where it says Tidal Flat. Right there, where the lily pad is, is where we launch from. That's in, dude. That is insane. So right above it, where it says the lily pad, that restaurant, that's where we launch from. So then, okay, I'm gonna back up a little bit. So with that in mind, like, do you know in general? How long that'll take you on a good day and a bad day? Because if you're if you're if milk running, if it's calm, if it's slick calm, it takes me 42 minutes running 75 mile an hour to get to the mouth of a chick. God, that is nuts wow. to have that. And so we were saying earlier wow. too, if you've never done it, you got to really make sure you look at your maps and do two and things a, with tidal. <laughs> have a tidal relationship with Jesus. Like you you're were going. saying the other day, the sunken <laughs> ships and stuff. Damn. You just, oh yeah, you have to be careful, knowing where your channels are, knowing where you can run. Dear um, God. Yeah. Hell of a run, man. Oh, and the best part is if you get down to the mouth of the chick right there, um, so that whole left side right there is nothing but a flat. So when you got to come in there, if you don't know how to run across mm-hmm. that flat, yeah. you got to go down below the chick because mm-hmm. the channel oh, comes shit. in up on the right hand side. Mm-hmm. So that adds another five minutes on you. So, and I think this is a really cool topic to something that I think we might have talked about. No, we did about the F1 bass. How has that changed your strategy and the James River in general with the, the stocking of the F1 in specifically the chick to where you got to have some kind of strategy in the chick because of the quality of bass mm-hmm. there? It's just different versus the Potomac River. Does that affect it at all how the river fishes because of the Oh, F1? I don't think the chick has any bigger fish than the James. Really? No. You got to think. Everybody and their brothers run down to the chick in every open that we've had down there, and they all get released in the James. So then why do you think there is this fascination with with making that hellacious run down there well see that's the thing all right so with the chick it's a little bit smaller a little bit more confined it's a little bit easier to get around those bigger fish whereas the james you have a lot higher salinity levels in the summertime for example interesting and okay they're a little bit harder to figure out where to get those bigger bass because you can fish offshore on the james actually really yes there's areas that i 
me personally, I got a couple spots that's in 15 mm-hmm. to 18 foot. Um, so and kind of like a lakeish type of vibe. Yeah, you can yeah, you can sure. do stuff like that. Um, like Chris Dillo, when he won it, he won it out of eighteen foot. That's crazy. And he caught an eight pounder every single day out of the James. He never left the James. That's yeah. nuts. So, um, and like Iconelli, when he won, he was fishing twelve foot. Because if you listen and he to was throwing a crankbait. Wide eyed, and that's why he says the James. But yeah, because like he, if you fish, if you listen to any other podcast and they talk about the James, you will never literally hear about the river. They mm-hmm. only talk about the chick. And so if you've never fished the river before, you think, like, well, the James just sucks. You've got to go to the Chick. And that's what I believe, too. I'll give you an example. This year I fished five tournaments on the James. My smallest bag was 17 pounds, and I never left the James. That's crazy. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm – yeah. It's they're, – they're there. There's giants there. I have caught eight-pounders out of the James. Yes, the potential for a 10- to 12-pounder is in the Chick. Interesting. Okay. But at the same time, they shot Queens Creek and the James and shocked up two 12 pounders uh, two years ago in our regional. That's wow. nuts. So, what? Interesting. Compare and contrast the Potomac and the James. Is there a lot of similarities, or is it because the it, does does the weight of fish change your strategy? Do they fish kind of the same, or is it completely two different animals? Two different animals. Because mm-hmm. people would think time. tides are all the same. Like, yeah. yeah, all tides fish the same, but there are they're different bodies of water. Way different. What would you, what would you like big, big noticeable differences? Not, not micro, but big, big time. Um, well, I'll start with, you got fish deeper. Mm-hmm. You can catch fish deeper on the James or the chick. Um, but one, you don't have the cypress trees on the Potomac okay. where a lot of these fish funnel to that. The chick and the James, yeah, you got hydrilla or milfoil. I'm not, I'm not good at identifying, to yeah. be honest with you. Um, but it's not like the Potomac where you've got miles of grass. Mm-hmm. You've got very s- like specific areas that do have that grass. Interesting. Okay. Most of the time, it's just lily pads, cypress trees, and that's all you got. Do you feel like that changes you as an angler? So I grew up fishing the Potomac, where you would yeah you'd have a grass bed and about seven hundred people in there. And it changes your mindset when dealing with boat pressure and all that other stuff because you're used to fishing like these are the spawning bays. This is just this is what you do. Does the James fish that way with the pressure, or because you don't have these massive flats that you have 500 boats on, do you feel like you can be more intimate with your area where I don't want to see seven other boats, or are you just like fine, like yep, this is tidal, it's okay to have boats around me, or are you trying to run away from the traffic in a game plan? The Chickahominy, yes. Okay. You'll have a lot of boats around you, uh, especially up around the dam area up there. I mean, I've seen it where there's 30 boats lined up on one lily pad stretch. I mean, but the James, on the other hand, I'm more like, yeah, it's tidal. I don't mind if there's other boats. Like, my personal mind said, oh, it's okay, it's another boat in my mm-hmm. area. Um, but it, more or less, it's a lot of the stuff, like, I fish particularly on the James. It's small, short stretches that I'm fishing. Um, that fish like their funnel points type deal where yeah. fish just get funneled to. I don't want to see another boat in there gotcha. personally, okay? Uh, because the pressure will mess them up. A lot of times the James is dirtier, so if you get a lot of boat pressure, you're having the dirty water plus the tide plus the boat pressure. It makes it them really not want to bite at all. Do you feel like the does the tide is it does the tide have more defined um, highs and lows compared to the Potomac? Is it about oh, yeah. the same? Okay. Um the the you know the Potomac what fluctuates a foot to two feet yeah if that you know the James will two to three in certain areas oh wow okay. um Rappahannock will go five to seven in certain areas and you talked about wind too it was amazing to me being down a chick how that was that wind is blowing keeping that water in I mean it, it oh. could, I mean flood stage really I mean it's and it's not coming out you know because that wind <laughs> wind's keeping it in and I've it's seen just it totally two total opposite yeah. uh, two years ago in our regional Pulled down there. Probably. I was fishing an inner channel with cypress trees mm-hmm. that you got to know how to get back into that little inner channel. Um, I turned and looked out, and it was all land out there, and I've never seen that before. Holy crap. And there's only one little <laughs> narrow opening to get in there, and I looked back, and I had just enough water to blow mud as I come oh out. My. Wow. It, would that be, between the Potomac and the James, which is harder to navigate to learn? Oh, James, the 100%. James. Is that one of the hardest places to navigate that you've been to in all your tournaments? No. Really? No. What would number one be? Um, definitely the Wachita River where I was just at, <laughs> getting back into like Darbone Bayou and stuff where, um, like pull up the Wachita on that real quick. I'll show you something that blew my mind going in there. Cause you're looking like you're running across Chickamuxkin Bay, but you can't see nothing. Mm-hmm. And your channel is only as wide as this table. If you miss it, you're literally ripping your whole motor off. 
how much experience is he pulling that up? How much uh, like the James? How how many times have you or how many years have you fished the James to get to where you're at now? Uh, it's in Louisiana. Um, what's that? Like how how long? How many years have you been fishing the James? Uh, how much experience have you had on it to get to where you are now to know it like you do? Um, I fished it when I was younger with my dad mm-hmm. back when the fishing was if you caught twelve pounds you were a god on that river. Mm-hmm. Um. So, like, I, I understood some things, mm-hmm. you know, then. I wish back then I knew what I knew now kind mm-hmm. of deal because, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, we didn't really fish it that much together. So, I, I'd say four or five years on it, okay. to be honest with you. Um, Sounds like you're going to be fishing a lot more, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, like, I got, I got to the point where I was one of those people, like, with Bugs Island and mm-hmm. the James and the Potomac. I fished Anna all the time. Right. I loved Anna. Right. But I knew if I ever wanted to do something, I had to learn these other places. That's right. I guess that's what I was kind of getting to because I know a couple times I've been down there with the youth. It's like each time I go, I learn a little bit more. You yeah. Know, and it's uh, it takes, and it's like what you're talking about the graphs. It takes time. You can't. That, that was my problem with working so much. I'm just not on the water as much as I need to be to get good. You know, at fishing. Uh, different times of the year, but just being out there on the water. I mean, you got to go. You oh yeah, go the time on the water time is on the water key. Is key. Is key. I think it is right. No, nope, this might be Arkansas. Yeah, it's probably pulling up Wachita Lake. Well, Wachita Lake, Louisiana. No, nah. nah, don't do like do the river. Oh, river. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's the other thing, you know, we talked before about just the opportunity from. Is it right there in Monroe? To right in this down here. That's. Pickwick. The heck is this thing wanting to do for you? There's Dallas. Should be right there around. There's Louisiana, Baton Rouge. It's up north. It's by Arkansas. Do you see a Monroe? Again, as they're pulling that up, you just think about what bass fish, chasing a fish. Chasing the, a fish. Where it's taking you. Um, Can't see a Monroe. Huh. This is how dangerous think. this place is to, to navigate. You can't find it on that. No, you can't. <laughs> and see, you can get to Arkansas from no. Louisiana on this river. There was guys running up there. This yeah. place. That, dude, that river system through there is ridiculous. Yeah, that's, eh. that's Mississippi. You yeah. can't find it. Don't worry about it. But it's, Still. dude, that place is, I'm telling you, you miss the channel when you get back in them bayous. You're ripping your motor off. It's ridiculous. Mm. And you talked about um, a river that I have never heard any information on, the Rappahannock, another Virginia river. Yeah. Like, have you actually fished tournaments on that? Like, what, what is oh, that, yeah. what's that place like? Oh, um, well, when I, f- I haven't fished tournaments on it in years, but when I first started fishing tournaments on it, uh, springtime, 15, 17 pounds you win. Really? Uh, mix, a lot of times it would be some mixed bags, smallmouth and largemouth. Um, is that a smaller river than the, the James? I think that would uh, be the you can third. Run, you can still run 40 minutes on that place to get to places. If wow. you put depends on where you put in at though, uh, you put in at City Docks right there in historic downtown Fredericksburg, which I recommend don't do that if anybody wants to do a tournament on the Rappahannock. You can't put your boat on trailer on low tide. Yeah, that's what um, we found this year. We, were, <laughs> we actually had it on the schedule, and and Rick went down and tried, and he realized he had to wait wait forty five minutes hour really? for it to come yep. up because he couldn't get it the boat on the trailer. Yep. So yeah, they, they said I guess since they took the dam out, I think that yeah yep has been a while, but it's it's cause it to silt in there yep. there's a bar basically a sandbar i mean you can get in on high tide but if that once that low tide comes in that bar is so shallow you can't mm. you can't load your boat but so that's good advice yeah i know um <laughs> we uh but nowadays they do a bunch of tournaments uh for the on the rappahannock kind of like the uh potomac teams but it's a rappahannock trail oh cool um and a lot of guys that fish the potomac teams fish that rappahannock stuff and they go, I think they launch out of Tappahannock, somewhere okay. down that way. And, I mean, if you don't have 20 pounds, you ain't doing nothing. That's crazy. <laughs> that place is unbelievable now. Hydrilla's in there. Lily pads is in there. They got good vegetation now. Um, if you want, you run way up the river towards City Docks, fish creek mouth, catch small mouth, catch large mouth. Like, hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. You're not going to go up there and be like, I'm going to catch five small mouth today. Yeah. Um, they're kind of one of those, oh, my God, I caught a small mouth type deal things. But that place, and it's got snakeheads in it now, too, that – are ridiculous like it's worse than potomac it's wow. crazy because like unless there are big tournaments out of there and this is one reason we you know, i really wanted to create this is you never hear about these other fisheries mm-hmm. you would think if you've never been from virginia you have only like two places you right. can go mm-hmm. you wouldn't know that there's another river you could probably catch a 20 pound sack mm-hmm. out of that probably doesn't get the pressure either oh no it, it has no pressure that place is so much fun 
that that is now do you think because we have so many tidal wars that where you just that comfort comes from is you have just lived here your whole life that it's just it's second nature it doesn't get you don't get overwhelmed by it um well i i want to really like say it was a lot due to the extreme bass anglers because they did Mm -hmm. rappahannock potomac james river they Mm -hmm. did all of them so i had to learn at a younger age when i was first learning how to find fish how to figure them out on the title so i really grew to liking that Mm -hmm. so um i like the style that you can fish doing it more or less than anything else so i would go spend like one year i didn't fish anna all year I spent my whole year wow. fishing the Battle of the Border to learn Potomac. <laughs> um, I spent a whole year driving three hours in the morning down to Bugs Island and three hours after I was done fishing back home to learn bugs. Mm-hmm. Um, same with the James. Like I would just spend years doing that as I was fishing some other tournament trails just so I could learn these other bodies of water. Mm-hmm. Um, like I was explaining to Jared, I, you're not going to get anywhere fishing Lake Anna. Mm-hmm. Right. But these other places, if you learn how to do them, you know, these bigger bodies of water, you can learn more and get hone your skills better is the mm-hmm. best way to put it. Mm-hmm. That's right. Because you got so many different styles. And then you can take stuff you learned at Bugs Island, mm-hmm. Lake Hartwell, yep. Gaston, wherever, mm-hmm. and put it into play on Lake Anna or Potomac or the James and stuff like that. We've talked about that a lot. And it really, you've even tried, you, you even do some trout fishing too, don't you? Oh, yeah. You around your local water. Really? I went trout fishing the other day. Yeah. What is the trout fishing like where you're at? Is it, is oh, it, all it's, is it stocked? And so I live, as right? of right now, I live in Madison. So I okay. fish the Rose and Robinson River, which river. unbelievable yeah. trout rivers. Mm-hmm. Really? And if you want, like, if anybody ever wants to go try it, go hike up the state park mm-hmm. on the Rapidan or the uh, Rose, mm-hmm. and you can catch native trout that, you know, 10 inches long, which is a big one, and have a blast all summer long. Yeah, are the you, Rose near Old Rag Mountain? Is that the one that's yeah. coming out oh, of yep, the yep, yep, yep. Spinning yeah. tackle or fly? Uh, me, rose. personally, spinning tackle because spin it's just very – I'm not good with a fly rod. I can't do the little <laughs> confined areas <laughs> with a fly yeah. rod. But there's guys that do fly fishing up there. Um, uh, I'm not sponsored by them, so don't say this. But Graves Mountain Lodge, you ever want to do it, go check out Graves Mountain Lodge. Place, Stay yeah. out there, yeah. and mm-hmm. you can – right there on the rivers. Yep. You can trout fish in front of the lodge. I didn't even know no, that's a great – yeah. no, I mean, plug it because, I mean, this is, that's what we're about, too. Is, yeah. Uh, you know, you're, and that's what we find too. Is we're not uh, obviously you're chasing chasing largies. I mean, but at the same time, fishing, fishing. Oh yeah, uh, trout, trout fishing, fishing teaches you I how mean, to play yeah. that drag and fight yeah. fish on light line. And that lodge is a great lodge. Oh, it's I amazing. Mean, that's a great for there's got cabins you can stay in. There's, yep. uh, I mean, it's a restaurant there. I mean, people can you know you can take your your business there and have company oh, yeah. events and stuff too. Like you said, they got oh, trout yeah, they got there, so trout fishing, tell, hiking tell trails us what it is again. Graves Mountain Lodge. Graves so. Mountain Lodge. Yep. Okay. Uh, just call up there and ask. They got a hotel there. They got cabins, mm-hmm. houses you can yep. stay in, everything like that. They're great people. Link yep. to them will be in the description of the episode too, as long yeah. with our with our guest information. Mm-hmm. Um, how how does trout fishing like? Do you just do that? Do you feel like it gives you a benefit in the bass realm, or is that something you do that's completely separate? Like, talk about that. Is there a transition or a translation between the two different sports? Um. Uh, honestly yeah i mean you're fighting fish on small gear you know when you're throwing the little spinning stuff and the big thing is these reefers are so clear you can see your bait fall in front of these fish's face wow so it teaches you how to in a high current place your bait to where it's going to fall directly down into the fish's face to where it will eat it okay um and then you get to watch them eat it and do all that stuff so it teaches you like bed fishing you can actually be able you know how some guys are like but did my bait disappear behind it? Did he eat it? You know? No, you know, okay, that fish ate my bait. Mm-hmm. So that's it how it's that, taught me. And it has the current, too. And I know you've also fished a river, Shando River. Oh, yeah, so big that time. current, because then we were talking earlier about a lake having yeah. current, talking about rivers, current. And, yep. and I've, you know, you're exactly right. looking for that eddy, reading the water. Reading the water. Reading the water and seeing, you know, what what is that bait? Where are those fish staging, you know, in behind that rock? You know, as food comes down, you know, they can sit there with less resistance. Uh, let the current bring the food down by yep. them, you know, so just learning, you know, the fish. Well, that uh, year at Pickwick, mm-hmm. uh, if it wasn't for the Shenandoah River, I would not have caught the fish there I caught. Go. Really? Cool. Correct. I'm crazy. telling you, it was, I, Dad and I practiced together. We went down one stretch. They were pulling. I couldn't tell you how many thousand. You had to put your trolling motor on as high as it could go, and it usually died by noon. That's how much <laughs> current was rolling down that lake. <laughs> Um, there was guys going back to the ramp, getting a next set of batteries put in their boat Is so they could right? go back and continue fishing. Wow. That's nuts. Um, so it was, that was a lot of current, but being able to find those eddies, mm-hmm. that's the only reason I caught what I caught. 
when okay. I was there. I had one spot. It was a bluff point that stuck out further than the rest. Made a bigger eddy, and they were stacked mm-hmm. in it. Mm-hmm. And all I did was back home, like Shenandoah River, mm-hmm. you get them smallmouth schooling. They're like, okay, let's throw my little whopper plopper, you know, something like that. Well, in practice, I caught them on it. What happens on the Shenandoah when it gets cold? You can't catch them on top water. I throw a little swim bait. That's what I ended up doing at Pickwick, and I mm-hmm. caught 30, 40 some pounds in three days. Mm-hmm. So that's crazy. It, you know, just the Shenandoah River alone taught me how to do that. Like, for anybody that wants a place to learn how to grass fish, fish current for smallies, do stuff like that, go to the Shenandoah Boat Landing in the town of Shenandoah. Because in the summertime, right there in the middle is a grass mat. You can learn how to frog, punch, and do all that. That's where I learned to do it. So that's Ray that's really good stuff. Me. Ray wants to go to Shenandoah. <laughs> Basil's been talking about it. He's oh, like, yeah. go there next, you know. So, to your point, like that, there's so much water out there. So much water, so much to do. I mean, you... You couldn't hardly do it in a lifetime, really, Mm-mm. if you think about oh, it. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. But but you got to find it. You know, and we mm-hmm. hopefully, to, to, to really expand on that, you know, as the show goes forward, mm-hmm. to let people know that there's a lot of opportunities mm-hmm. here that no one knows about. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a shame. A lot of hidden gems. <laughs> what um good stuff. Yeah. Really good stuff. Travis, listen, man, I, I just can't tell you enough. I really appreciate our relationship that we've had over the years. Mm-hmm. And you've always, from that time you came up and spoke um, and filled in um, to the times I've, every time I've called them, called you to you know come up for our frederick county bass meetings if we're getting ready to fish a body of water uh, you've come up and you we put the map out you've talked to the kids about where to fish what to fish and things like that you've been an open book um to the time at gaston he came down when you the boat captain i know you talked before about other people too you you, you know helped us out um, when you took jacob out and, and the night before that gaston tournament i alluded to this earlier when we were talking to jeremy um, and we had been struggling down there um and then you you know, talk to the boys um, the night before that tournament, and then just the things that you had to say were, I think, really profound. And and just that idea of one thing I like about you too is you you mentioned earlier about not to be cocky. Mm-hmm. Um, good athletes. You've been and you played baseball. You you've grown up. You played baseball and other sports too. But good athletes, um, great people. They they they. It's not cockiness. It's confidence. Yeah. You yes. have a, a confident. Uh, demeanor about you and if, if you want to be good you've got to have that confidence mm-hmm. factor and uh but at any rate you've uh and we went out and you you know, took jake about and like i think you all finished second that yeah, day got he second. Finished second and what was it really cool too i heard him say about how we were talking earlier too he has taught these kids so much um and and they're listening they're paying attention and then they're sometimes they're going out and flying or whatever but then when he said to one time too about how Jacob taught him something, I thought I kind of was like, "What?" You know. Oh and yeah. So <laughs> it's uh, and he kind of alluded to that earlier. So I, I think that's pretty cool too. So, um, but I just want to say I wish wish you luck. And, thank uh, you. And I just want to thank you though for mm-hmm. everything you've done for us here, at, you know, Jake's Bait and Tackle, and with our youth and in our local, you know, anglers and things like this. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you all for having me. A lot of guys, because a lot of guys, when you start competing like that, yeah. they're a closed book. They don't want to talk. They don't want to share their secrets because you're competing. Yeah. Uh, but you're you've never been that guy you're you're an open book willing to share i'll tell you I, what i'm throwing you don't know the spots i'm fishing that's right <laughs> a- amen <laughs> and and before we leave uh where can people find you where can people follow you oh uh i have a fa- uh, fishing page called travis luger fishing on facebook that's about the only thing i'm not big on social media and technology i'm terrible at it so most of the time i post it on that um mm-hmm. I've got so many friends on my actual Facebook. I've pushed people to go to this fishing page because you can follow me on that much easier. Um, so that's that. And then also I want to thank a couple sponsors yes, real quick. Absolutely. TFO Rods, um, Crown Battery. They've done a lot for me, helping me get batteries in the boat constantly every year brand new. So they're great people for that. Um, and then I want to thank MVP that I just picked up uh, actually yesterday. He's doing a lot for me coming into this season. And then I also want to thank, I got to thank him, Solar Bat Sunglasses. Dude, some of the best sunglasses on the market, I'm telling you. I've learned a lot actually with bed fishing because of these sunglasses. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's it. If I'm missing any, I'm sorry. <laughs> so any sponsors he missed, they'll be in the episode description that you can find wherever you digest your podcast along with his social media handle so you can you can follow this guy and help support his career as he starts the bass opens in 2022 you can also find us on youtube uh this all podcast episodes drop on tuesday and fishing videos drop on thursday um give us a follow 
my name is Thomas Aarons with Fishing the DMV. And Jared, for those that don't know either that April James tournament, if you go on Bassmaster, mm -hmm. most people know this, but some that don't go on the Bassmaster site and they can, they'll do the live, live weigh-ins. Yep. And when you come across, you can learn a lot from that too. Yeah, or absolutely. come to Osborne Landing and watch oh, in person right there. That is actually a good point too. It's close enough to uh, and go down if in you, person. And people that make day three, the weigh-ins will be at Bass Pro Shop, so you can shop and watch the weigh-ins. That is that awesome. is a good deal. That, that is a good deal. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Guys, thanks. Yeah, thank you all. You're welcome. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.